In 1995, I was sent to prison for a crime I did commit. This is my story. It was a Friday night. I was at home with my mum, Winnie. And my neighbour, Aunt Eula. <laughs> I put the telly on. Crime Monthly comes on. And Crime Monthly is a programme which appeals for some of Britain's most wanted criminals. And they're talking about a demonstration that I'd been on a few months before, which was to shut down the Nazi headquarters in Welling, South East London. And then, bang! There's a picture of me throwing bricks at riot police. <laughs> Oh God, Charlie boy, you better run, boy, run! Leave the country, oh God! Oh Jesus, I told you not to go on that demonstration, but you never listened to your mother. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now under the hour of his coming, amen. I've spoken to Jesus, and you're not going to prison. <laughs> Now go to sleep and we'll talk about it in the morning. <laughs> 2 30 a.m. I can hear the police at the front door. And my mum goes to answer the door. And the police officer says, we've come to check the bail address for James Ryder. That's my brother. But my mum doesn't hear this. She thinks they've come for me. And she says, my son Charles was on crime monthly last night. He's in the living room. <laughs> <laughs> so this big, giant police officer comes into our little leprechaun house, takes his helmet off, ducks down and says, you were on TV last night. You were shown on Crime Monthly being involved in a riot at Welling. Yes, it was me. What's this all about? I was at university. I came down to the anti-racism rally, got involved in a riot. Why did you throw bricks at the police? They attacked me. It was self-defence. I'm arresting you on suspicion of being involved in serious disorder at Welling. You do not have to say anything, but what you do say may be given in evidence. I was going to give myself in tomorrow anyway. I was then handcuffed, put in a police car, and brought to Tootin Police Station. And then from Tootin Police Station, I was brought to Bexley Heath Police Station. And as I sat in this police car, it was a really strange experience for me. It was, I was thinking, it was like I'm in a taxi and I'm talking to the driver asking, how's your day been? Um, and did you nick anyone today? And there was just <laughs> a total silence. And then one of the police officers turned around and he went, who are you with? And um, 
I want you to joke and say, I'm with the Woolwich. Because <laughs> there was an advert on the telly at the time. But I was also shitting myself. And I was like, um, so I said, well, I don't understand the question. And then he said, who are you with? Which group were you with? Anti-Nazi, League Communist, Marxist, who are you with? And I said, um, I came down to the demo with my mates. And then I was brought to the reception at Bexley Heath Police Station. So, uh, what suspect number were you on Crime Monthly then, son? Suspect number three? Ha ha ha! We got suspect number three here from Crime Monthly, lads. He's a dirty screw. You're looking at four years. I was then let out on bail, but things didn't get much easier for me living with an alcoholic father. You're a dirty rotten thing. 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 I curse the day you were born. 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 I've forgotten more in a minute than you've learnt in a fucking lifetime. I've learnt more in a minute than you've learnt in a lifetime. I've learnt more in a minute than you've learnt in a fucking lifetime. Who are you calling a fucking alcoholic? I got hold of some tablets and I just wanted to die. Because to me, the prospect of four years in prison just felt too much. And then I contacted Alison Crocker from Wandsworth Volunteer Bureau. And she told me about some volunteering in a, a holiday home in Southport. There was this home for people with severe disabilities. And, and she thought the break would do me good. And um, so I went up to Southport and uh, there were three people that, that, that stood out while I was there. The first person stood out, I remember, because all that he said all day was, Booger it! Booger it! Booger it! <laughs> and um, the second person was a person who I was matched up with, who he had a, a disability which made his arms and legs constantly shaking. And I found myself one night taking him out in this, to this kind of cabaret type club wheeling him in and uh, as I was wheeling him in this lady comes over and she sees his arms and legs shaking and she's like all right love great to see you dancing already <laughs> and um, what's going through my mind as I'm pushing a wheelchair is how's he going to hold his pint and um the third person I remembered was someone who she had been a police officer and was injured in duty and uh someone had got a concrete block and they'd smashed it on her spine and left her paralyzed and she said she'd join the police to help people and she had to use this special machine to communicate. And, um, and I, I said to her, um, do you hate the person that's done this to you? And she replied, no, because there's too much hate in the world.
After waiting nearly two years, I was sent to prison for 16 months. I was brought down to a cell and then locked into what felt like a really small cupboard in a prison van and it felt really hard to breathe. And next to me, one of my co-defendants, he's shouting, Quaker, Quaker, because I had a character reference from the Quakers. And then bizarrely, he starts wolf whistling at this girl that's passing a prison van. And I'm thinking, what girl is going to hear someone wolf whistling in a prison van and think, there's my dream man? <laughs> and then I looked out of this small, dark window. I'm thinking, where are they taking me? And is prison going to be like you see in those films where people get gang raped, where they get murdered, where they get beaten up? As we get closer to the prison, the prison gates opened up like castle gates. And waiting to lay down the law was the governor of the prison. I'll have no rioting in my prison. And then I was brought to reception where I was fingerprinted, photographed, seen by a doctor. And then stripped. And to me, being stripped felt like being sexually abused because I even had to show them my foreskin. I was given some really smelly, dirty clothes to put on that hundreds of other prisoners, because they had lots of holes and they stunk.
I had a prison bag that I could put someone that I put my stuff in, and all the other stuff was put into a box. And then was brought out onto a wing. And being brought out onto the wing, for me, it was like you see in those films where you have the meshing along the top to stop people from committing suicide or from pushing people off. And then these heavy steel doors. And a prison officer had shouted that I was on the twos and I didn't understand what twos meant. So I was looking on twos for these, on these cell doors. And then the prison officer shouted over, that's, that's the second level, you muppet. And as I was going up the stairs, I was thinking, what's the person that I'm going to be sharing a cell with? What are they going to be like? I was feeling really angry. And um, I actually wanted to, I wanted to hit, hurt someone. And um, I felt really angry. And, I'm, um, and then when I got to, to where the cell door, I went to knock on it. And the prison officer said, in there, you muppet. My name's Jamie. What's your name? Charlie. What are you owing for, Charlie? With riots? I've been in a few riots in my time. What am I in for? You don't ask somebody what they're in for, bruv. My babs came on a visit today and they took our guns off her. Can you believe it? I think it's time to have a shit. I know what you're thinking, Charlie. What's a gangster like me doing in a place like this? I must say, Charlie, you're very quiet. After a week of Jamie's anal and verbal diarrhoea, I asked to move cells. And I was moved in with um, one, of, one of my co-defendants. And um, he was a really, really good, good, good guy, but he had a, a drugs problem. And it, um, during visits, his wife, they would kiss and then pass drugs, which he would then want to shit out in the cell. Um, and it's got me thinking about drugs being passed during visits. Prisoner never be brought out first. Sometimes have to wait long periods of time. The wife would arrive. They would kiss, passionately pass drugs, and then argue for the rest of the visit. <laughs> <laughs> So during visits, we'd think about what it was like for a child on a visit. And I read a poem that where a child has spelled out the words prison. And they wrote, P, people say bad things about me because of my dad. Ah, respect they don't because of my dad. I, it hurts when they say bad things about me because of my dad. Eh, silly dad for being naughty. Oh, on my birthday and Christmas, I really miss him. And then N, no, I don't want to be like my dad except for his heart. And then they'd written I, and then a love heart, very much my dad, around this, this poem. Um, in prison, I witnessed some, some violent situations. And I remember playing playing football with with um with one of my co-defendants and he he 
while we were playing, he was getting more and more agitated, and he ran up behind someone and and knocked them knocked them down onto the onto the floor, and then was brought up to his cell where he was shouting down at me, "Come on, Quaker! Come on, Quaker!" Which was really winding up the the people that we were playing against. After a month at HMP Canterbury, I was moved to HMP Aldington. <coughs> and I remember there was a, being on a dorm with a, a guy that had won six million on the lottery before he was sent to prison. And um, he, <coughs> he, we saw, watched a documentary with him. And in the documentary, he's driving around with expensive cars and um, sort of prison talk about stuff to do with for example, when the person that they, he was saying was his cleaner, he would say, well, she's not really a cleaner, she's a dealer, and trying to make himself sound more sort of street cred. But at the end, they said to him, are you worried about going to prison? And he said, no, I think all cons are all idiots, at which point all eyes were on him. But what was really, what was really, really bizarre for me, anyway, about, about this, this situation was the fact that there was a tabloid photographer climbing around on a roof to get a photograph of Lee Ryan. Christmas was the loneliest part of my sentence and to help me get through I had quite a lot of letters of support from people that were at the demonstration and, um, and letters were really really important important to me and um, when I used to get a letter it would have the surname and then prison number and stuff on it and, um, and I, I got this letter from, from someone sent to me via the anti-Nazi league that I carried in my heart through, through, through my sentence to Anti-Nazi League. Dear friends, in receipt of your letter, 15th September 95, in reference to demonstrators welling March 16, 10, 93 against BMP headquarters, of course I feel more bitter about what the judge, police and other people connected with the law who sentenced the nine men to prison. The above mentioned obvious do not understand that these men were marching against the danger towards mankind so also including the above-mentioned people of the law. One day the wrong will be rightened again when the above men of law are confronted with the danger as I have been with loss of everything dear to me. Please find and close £10 note in support of the men mentioned in your letter. A small donation and leave it to you in what way this is added with others for our friends imprisoned. I feel bitter and sick inside because of the injustice without feeling and understanding towards the fighters for freedom and justice. With all respect and hope for better understanding to all mentioned here in my letter, yours sincerely, Leon Greenman, Auschwitz survivor, 98288. And I, I then read um, a piece uh, that, that Lee, of Leon Greenman and, and what had happened to him, and this, this is a, a short extract from, from his book, uh, An Englishman in Auschwitz. Greenman describes his arrival in Birkenhau. The women were separated from the men, Elsie and Barney were marched about 200 yards away to a queue of women. I tried to watch Elsie. I could see her clearly against the blue lights. She could see me too, for she threw me a kiss and held our child up for me to see. What was going through her mind, I will never know. 
Perhaps she was pleased that the journey had come to an end. We had been promised that we could meet at the weekends after our work was done. We will have a lot to talk about, I thought to myself. Elsie, her grandmother and Barney were sent straight to the gas chambers. Leon's last sighting of them was as they were taken away in an open truck. Elsie had made capes with peaked hoods for herself and Barney from bright red velvet curtains. Leon saw the two splashes of red. He called out, but his wife never heard him or looked back. And I remember being locked up in what felt like a toilet, really tiny space, thinking about, for, for 19 hours of the day, thinking about Leon, Leon Greenman and his family. Another way that I got through my sentence was before I was sent to prison, I enjoyed playing lacrosse, dancing, and running. So during exercise, I used to put my headphones on and I used to imagine that I was playing lacrosse and would dance and run around the prison yard.
see someone escaped. And what happened was that during exercise, this prisoner climbed up onto the roof. And while he was up on the roof, the uh, other prisoners made his bed out to look like he was still sleeping. So it meant that in the morning, the prison officers came around a few times to check to see where he had got to. And while they were checking, he had escaped back to Belgium. I was quite happy he'd escaped. We had a table tennis competition, and I managed to get to the final of this table tennis competition. And everyone put in a, in a chocolate bar, with the winner taking all the chocolate bars. And uh, I managed to get to the final of this, this table tennis competition. And then this happened. The last month of my sentence, I was allowed to do community work and then would be in a different, uh, a different wing of the prison. And it meant I had better access to the telephone, which I didn't like using too often because there was lots of arguments over the phone. And uh, I rang home and I, I found out that, um, that one of my friends had, had committed suicide. And, um, and I wasn't able to go to the funeral. And, um, remember being in the cell thinking about him jumping in front of a train. And, um, and felt quite helpless that I, that I wasn't able to, to help him. 
and that I couldn't, uh, I couldn't be with his family and stuff. And the same, the same week that I found out about my friend Jonathan, Anne Whittacombe, who was then the minister for prisons, came in, came into the prison. <coughs> Just before I left, uh, there's a prison newspaper called Inside Time. <coughs> and uh, in Inside Time, there was a poem that I read that really spoke to me called Prisoners. <coughs> Prisoners, we want them to have self-worth, so we destroy their self-worth. To be responsible, so we take away responsibility. To be part of our community, so we isolate them from the community. To be positive and constructive. So we degrade them and make them useless. To be non-violent. So we put them where there is violence all around. To be kind and loving people. So we subject them to hatred and cruelty. To quit being tough guys. So we put them where the tough guy is respected. To quit hanging around losers. So we put all the losers under one roof to quit exploiting us. So we put them where they exploit each other. We want them to take control of their own lives, own their own problems and quit being parasites. So we make them totally dependent on us. That Prisoners was written by Judge Dennis Shaleen, Supreme Court USA. And I'm going to finish now with a poem that was written by uh, a prisoner called Malcolm, which was a winner of a curse like and Kersler do arts, uh, have an arts um, competition for, for prisoners over the country. And this, this, this uh, poem really spoke to me. It's called Your Questionnaire. There's no space in your questionnaire to tell you how it felt rowing on the fjords. Where in your risk assessment can I explain how it was to make love in Florence? When will you ask me about the mayor of Stockholm's speech in the Nobel Hall? Where do I tick the box to say what it's like to run in the True Deuce Mountains? Will this psychometric test show you the guts it took to climb Ayers Rock at age five? Is this the interview where I describe playing Frisbee for Ireland in the, at the World Championships? Is that the report which records the first time I saw a play at the National? Could that be the parole dossier that outlines the weekend spent youth hosteling with my dad? Just let me know when you want to hear about me. Thanks. Thanks.